we began with the practice of yoga and some general observations about various systems and their efficacy in that place. Uh, today also, I think I make a little preliminary survey of the of the need of this particular yoga, because in the traditional sense, the yogas that were current in India and are even now current in India, there has been an old basis of nature is retained. The radical and fundamental change that you have to notice in this yoga is that whereas in the old traditional yogas, the idea was that nature will remain fundamentally at foundation what it is. And something will be super added to man's consciousness, a higher consciousness, a contact with infinite consciousness, merging into cosmic consciousness, occasional meditation on the divine and presence of the divine personality or divine in, divine's presence. And then again, the reversion will be to the formed or you see the, the current nature of man. Now that was a common, common, correct, common idea and that has been even now the current idea. Is that uh, it doesn't require any, because their idea was that life is to remain what it is. And then by practice of yoga, you have to add something to the life as it is. Something more is to be added by acquisition of, you know, power of consciousness to expand from egoism into a wider consciousness, which you attain after years of meditation or trial. And then you meditate and you merge, you come back again. You come back to the old nature. You see, you come back to the old nature with some influence sometimes. As I yesterday told you, that make a saintly temperament, a temperament in which some powerful effect of the illumination is there, so that mind is pure or less selfish or not egoistic or altruistic or desire of doing good to others and so on. But that is about the highest change that is conceived in the old system of yoga. And also the path was such as to go by a narrow way. You see, you take up a mantra, some repetition of some formula or japa or concentrate on an idea or something that is given to you by somebody or by a book or by practice of somebody. And then you, you practice that and at the end of the practice, the result predicted comes. And the result predicted is a limited result which is meant for your experience and whatever indirect influence it exercises on your nature, well, you undergo that much change in your nature if it is called a change, but foundations do not change. It is only in the Gita that you find that there is some similarity to what Shirundo wants to wants mankind to do. That it is first acceptance of life and work and action. Action and life to be accepted for the divine in order to fulfill the divine in oneself. That is Gita's great teaching that even a battlefield can become a occasion for living the practice of yoga. That is to say, one is moved to it, not by any personal motive at all, but to fulfill the divine will. Now, this, that was something that in keeping. And also Gita has a synthesis of karma, jnana and bhakti, the knowledge of, of the yoga of knowledge, yoga of action, yoga of devotion. So that there is some similarity. But there is also a great departure, a great difference in Shirundu's yoga. And that is that as we are now have seen through our study of life divine, that the whole is a play of divine delight of existence and infinite delight is at play. And because it is a real existence, therefore the play is real. And the play is of the divine. Therefore the acceptance of this play and bringing of or emergence of Satchidananda, the divine consciousness here, is a solution of the problem. Now, therefore, if we want to evolve or make emerge in ourselves the divine consciousness, then it must manifest and express itself in the whole field of life. The whole field of life is legitimate to it. It is necessary that it must manifest itself in life. And in order that it may manifest itself in life, the nature of man must be fundamentally altered. Given the present nature, however great or however genuine, however you know, striking his realization may be, it will not have a permanent effect on life. If permanent effect of a spiritual attainment is to be had, 
then man must be prepared to take up the great work of transforming his nature. Nature must be transformed. And th uh, in this lies the great difference between the yoga which Shirdu wants mankind to, to understand and practice. And uh, in that sense, therefore, you see, it amounts to something like, a, you see, you have a house. And the house is built on certain foundation. And after some time you discover that the foundations are not right for any another building up if you want to raise upon this. Then these foundations will not stand. You understand? Then what you have to do is, well, then gather first, decide whether do you want to change the foundations? Because that is the only way to build up anything new. It's no use uh, on the old foundation. You won't be. It won't bear the weight. So what you have to decide is first to convince yourself that yes, this is the solution. We have to change the foundation. Well, if you are not convinced, there is no hurry. There is no yoga, no difficulty. Uh, time can take its own course, and one one has yeah, enough work in life to do. As you say, people are very busy. They don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> so there is enough to do. I mean that way. So there, there is no difficulty. But if there is a perception that, no, this is a solution and that foundations are not correct, we must change it. Then what you do is to gather materials. Gather the material for the foundation. Then lay down the foundation afterwards. So yesterday what we have talked is about gathering of the material, I think. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. yes. That the higher life must be the first priority. Perception must be that we have to learn from life. Values of life are relative. Social values are also relative. All these many things which we have gone through yesterday, well, prepare us for, first of all, understanding this necessity of changing the foundation. And therefore, throughout the practice of this yoga, most important is not how much time you dedicate to sitting down for meditation, but how much correct attitude you take. The attitude is most important. Attitude towards life, attitude towards action, attitude towards oneself, attitude, attitude towards society, attitude towards family, attitude towards property. That is important because that brings in the change, you see. Unless the attitude is fixed, you can sit for six hours in meditation and immediately as mother told one, one evening talk that you see immediately he comes out of meditation and if something is done which he doesn't like, he loses. <laughs> 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 All his meditation is gone and he's wild. Well, because uh, the, the nature has not changed. It's not his fault. He was quite genuine in meditation. He was all right. He didn't fake meditation. But then that does not affect here. You see, that is there, this is here, then it doesn't change. So in this yoga, what is important is an attitude toward life. Attitude constantly maintained throughout. Whether you are sitting in meditation or not is not important. Whether you are maintaining an attitude towards what you are doing at that time, action, work, life, property, family, society, everything. Well, attitude is that, yes, it is meant for me for growth. That I have to change the foundation of my nature and this has to help me in found, changing my foundation. Well, that, that has to be uh, hammered into oneself, that attitude is an important thing. And therefore, decision has to be taken with a good thought and because aim is not an occasional contact with some divine consciousness, occasional merging into infinite, and then with a great delight and you like a, something enjoyable. You see, it takes, uh, you take, uh, for instance, um, you know, ice cream, then you enjoy it like that. This is ice cream on a higher level. You see, that is, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> exactly some, something wonderful and nice. And then you come back again and again as you are. Well, that this is in one sense, yes, it is more than ice cream, but then it is harder work than anything that you have you might have undertaken in life it is not a you know simple task it is an uphill work and a hard work it requires a change of complete attitude because the whole foundation is to be changed it's not a joke the whole foundation of nature is to be altered now nature is founded upon ego upon desire upon selfishness upon greed uh, upon all, you see, all kinds of things. Now, all that has to be changed and some other foundation is to be laid down. 
Now for that one has to be prepared. So that is why this change of attitude and understanding of the problem is necessary. It's not as if we are out for a temporary ex ex experience of higher consciousness or, uh, you see, in other words, to make all life, inner life as well as outer life, a field for the expression of that consciousness which we want to reach. When the foundations are laid down, then it is not man that will build up the whole structure. There is one great advantage that you are only required to consent to change the foundations. The building up of the structure is not entirely done by man. It is done by the divine. It is done by the higher power. So that labor you are saved. Your, your consent only will be necessary. You have to say yes. When he says, look here, I am going to do this. You say yes. This is all right. You are not to build. So it is a superstructure to be brought about by two energies or two agencies. The human aspirant, this, the disciple and the divine power. Foundation laying and decision to change the foundation belongs to this individual. He must decide and lay the foundations. When the foundations are laid, the building up, he has to consent to the higher power because it is a higher power that is to build up the higher life. That will be a different life. This is one life which we know. Life founded on ego, desire, ambition, uh, strife, hatred, conflict, you know, uh, some temporary joy, then again uh, suffering, pain, evil, all, uh, all that is life. We know that and we know the foundation. Now another life is to build upon another foundation. And what that building will be depends upon the higher power. Only what the foundation is, you are given to understand that this is the foundation. If you lay down this foundation, then a superstructure, what do you want? And you say, we want knowledge. Knowledge can be built up permanently on the present foundation. What do we want? We say, higher power, divine power. Divine power cannot act on the present constitution of man's nature. It can only influence him. It can only throw a ray, but it cannot work, you know, in its purity. We want delight. Well, it cannot work on the present foundation unmixed or undistorted. It will be always like that. So if that, those elements of the higher life are to be built up here in life and built up in human nature, then foundation is to be prepared so that on that foundation, you see, an illumination of higher knowledge or working of a higher power or the play of a higher delight can take place. See, that is necessary in order that the superstructure may be built. Well, and this change is rather radical. One has therefore to gather materials and we yesterday talked about some of the materials and uh, we have already considered some of the requisites and uh, if you have time then we shall today also consider some of the foundations. And, uh, it's a labor of delight. Because whatever happens, one can always take in with a sort of a detachment in an aim uh, to learn from whatever comes as a condition for his sadhana, as a condition for his growth. That is the attitude one has to adopt. About the attitude, he has put down one thing, and I think that is germane to today's subject at least. In spiritual progress, the spiritual progress does not depend on outer conditions. So much as in the way we react to them, to the outer condition, from within. People say that if I had very good condition, I would make great progress. There are many people who say like that. If I did not live in town, I would be in a condition to progress. If my job was not, uh, you know, to a 12 hours job, then I would be able to do. Or if my office was uh, manned by better people, I would be able to do my sadhana. There are people always like that, you see, because that is the idea that if outer conditions were all right, I would be progressing very quickly or well and, you know, without difficulty. That's why he replies that the inner spiritual progress does not depend on outer conditions so much as in the way which we react to them from within. That has always been the verdict of spiritual experience. It is why we insist on taking the right attitude. That's what I was just telling you. The right attitude and persisting in the attitude. 
that is to say on an inner state which does not depend on outer circumstances, a state of equality and calm, if it cannot be at once of inner happiness, on going more and more within and looking from within outwards instead of living in the surface mind, which is always at the mercy of shocks and blows of life. It is only from that inner state that one can be stronger than life. Because otherwise life has always, you know, actions and reactions and shocks. Well, if one wants to be stronger than life, then it is from inside, it is only from that inner state that one can be stronger than life and its disturbing forces and hope to conquer. To remain quiet within first, forming the will to go through the practice of yoga, refusing to be disturbed or discouraged by difficulties, by fluctuations, that is the first thing to be learned in the path. So that gives you an armor to prepare yourself with. I don't know whether I read this yesterday. The one thing to preserve is equanimity and make an opportunity. And one thing to preserve equanimity and make an opportunity and a means for progress out of all that happens in the course of life and in the practice of yoga. Whatever happens, you use it only as a means for right. using it as an occasion to learn something from. Not that this difficulty has come and now I cannot do anything because difficulty has come. Or because difficulty has come, I give up my work because uh, there is difficulty. On the contrary, you, de you detach yourself and take it in the spirit of equality, equanimity and you say, yes, now this has come. Well. What is it going to teach me? What is it going to give me? How, is it, how am I going to profit in my inner, inner life by what has come? Well, then first the, the pressure of it is reduced more than 60%. You see, first the most important result is that it is not able to influence, you know, the inner attitude by, by its shock or by not. What, there are people who have a, self-complacence about their spiritual life. Many of them are there. You see, I give you the instance of one friend of ours who said for six or eight years I am trying and I am not able to do and no result has come and you see I am thinking of giving up what is the use. Six to eight years I have tried and uh, no result has come. Well, I was compelled to listen to it for two or three days. Because of the occasion like that. Then afterwards when she, she became a little more familiar, so I had to then tell her that you mean to say, what you say amounts to this, that you understand what must happen to you better than God. Not only that, God is quite unjust because he doesn't give you the, the, the fruit that you deserve, the progress that you think must be given to you by now. Therefore, you are quite in a position to cert certify yourself that I am fit, I am all right, only something is wrong with the Divine and He, does not, <laughs> he doesn't do what He should do. <laughs> this, no, no, not that, I say, yeah, that is how the <laughs> mind plays, <laughs> you better make up your mind <laughs> to see clearly, otherwise this is what, what you say amounts to. If you analyze, analyze, and this, that is the position it will be ultimately revealed to you. If you see it clearly and impersonally, it means this only. When is the sense of, and that is why he is replying to one disciple like that. What severe demands and iron conditions you are laying on the divine. You practically say to the divine, I will doubt and deny you at every step, but you must fill me with your unmistakable presence. That's the first demand you made. I will be full of gloom and despair whenever I think of you or yoga, but you must flood my gloom with your rapturous, irresistible delight, Anand. <laughs> now he says, well, this is too much of a demand on the divine. He says, in such a, if such a miracle, he says at the end of the letter, such a miracle is to work. But you must give him some time. 
and uh, just a million part of a chance <laughs> because this is very great miracle and <laughs> you must give me chance you can't say that immediately the miracle must happen you go on denying and the divine goes on giving his present to you <laughs> <laughs> This, this condition comes, this is part of material. This is the part of the material before the foundations, you see. One is that whenever something happens, then, uh, as I told the instance of the lady friend of ours, that, uh, you see, I did so many times and so many years, and now I'm thinking of giving up. So if some experience comes, oh, it was nothing, very little experience. I got only, only a piece for half an hour. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's how, <laughs> you see, just say, uh, only I was quiet or, uh, or I saw some, you know, light inside and a very small lamp lighted inside. And they say, what is this little lamp I saw? It's all nothing, it's nothing, miracle didn't happen, something extraordinary didn't come. She is replying to that mentality, that when he lights, in the divine light, something in you, or is preparing a light, don't come in with a wet blanket of despondency and throw it on the poor flame. <laughs> yes. You will say, oh, it's a mere candle that's lit. Nothing at all. But in these matters, when the darkness of human, human consciousness and life and body has to be dispelled and dissipated, a candle is always a beginning. You begin with a candle, then a lamp can follow and afterwards the sun. So, you must, uh, you see, the, the, the tendency of human being to, to want to have big results to start with, uh, that is another material which we must uh, not have, and have a preparation to welcome the beginning of a small candlelight, you see, and uh, be enthusiastic even about a candlelight. And uh, then you have, the three elements that we, I think, did discuss partly were the, the aspiration, is it not? Surrender and faith, was it not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we go through the whole thing? Uh, my pages have got mixed up a little, but uh, well, I think the disciple is asking about surrender, you see, and uh, how to set one's will or path or one's mind on the path of yoga. How to do it? Is it by surrender? Is it by meditation? Is it by one's own will? Uh, some questions like that come to the, to the seeking mind. So he says, whether by your own effort of tapasya, tapasya is self-effort, or by surrender it does not matter. The one thing is, to remain or to become firm in setting one's own face to the goal. That is the most important thing, whether you succeed in doing it by your own effort or by surrender. To be firm in setting one's face to the goal. Once that has, it is set, one has, once has set, one has set his feet on the way, how can one draw back from it to something inferior? There are some people who have that idea of, you know, Arya Ponce, you come back to, to what one has left, all right. I was doing that work before, now I tried the yoga, and yoga doesn't succeed, so let me go back to what I was. And he's referring to that mentality also. If one keeps firm, falls do not matter. One rises up again and goes forward. It's like a child learning to walk. It falls, it doesn't mean that it will not walk, it will walk. And um, you have only to remain quiet and firm in your following of the path and your will to go to the end. If you do that, circumstances will in the end be obliged to shape themselves to your will because it will be then the divine will in you. You say the circumstances do not change, they don't change so long as they are necessary for growth. So they don't change. And you have to therefore persist in your will to go to the end of the path, then circumstances will change in the end and oblige to change because 
the this will that you have that circumstances in my life must change will cease to be your will it will become the divine's will then it will work the road of yoga is long and every inch of ground has to be won against much resistance and no quality is more needed by the disciple than patience and single minded perseverance these are the materials. We are not laying the foundation yet. Please note. It is only gathering the materials. <laughs> yes. You gather the materials in the form of yes, patience and single-minded perseverance with a faith that remains firm through all difficulties, delays and apparent failures. So to have that turning of the face definitively, looking at circumstances only from within to and uh, patience and single-minded perseverance with faith. That one can take with him as the material to begin the laying of the foundations, you see. It is quite true that left to yourselves you can do nothing. It means change your nature about that. That is why you have to be in contact with the higher force which is there to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. The only thing you have to do is to allow the force to act. This is quite enough for one, you see, to be able to allow. That is, that is where this con condition of the ego comes in the way. It is all the way, you know, the, the obstruction always offered by the human being, thinking that I will do. And then he finds that he can't do. Then he says, I can't do, therefore I won't do. <laughs> What you have to do is, the thing you have to do is to allow the force that acts in you and put yourself on its side, which means to have faith in it, to rely upon it, not to trouble and to harass yourself and to remember it quietly, to call upon it quietly, to let it act quietly. And if you do that, all else will be done for you. Not at once, because there is so much to clear away but still it will be done steadily more and more. Well, this is a promise of great, you know, optimism, because it gives a lot of hope to people who don't immediately seem to succeed and immediately want to despair because it doesn't immediately succeed. Uh, this is a result of a lot of hard work done uh, on the plane of human life. And it is not as it were, this is a theoretical, you know, philosophy that is given about yoga, but these are actually replies to people who have been trying to practice the yoga, have met with difficulties, and have got their solutions. And these are the lines along which uh, the solutions are suggested. And they are useful for us because they indicate to us what material we must take with us if we want to lay firm foundations of the yoga that we want to practice. You say that I will try again, but that is not sufficient. What is needed is to try always. You see, some <laughs> disciple wrote once that you say that, uh, you say, I must, I will try again. He said, No, that is not enough. You say, I will try always, steadily, with a heart free from despondency. As the Gita says, Anirvinna Chetasa, a mind that does not submit to despondency. Nobody has ever said that spiritual change is easy and it's an easy thing. All spiritual seekers will say that it is a difficult but supremely worth doing. It is difficult but supremely worth doing. If one's desire for the divine has become the master desire, then surely one can give one's whole life to it without repining and not grudge the time, difficulty or labor. See, there is a clarity in the thinking and uh, it drives you to think clearly. This is a very great uh, merit of Sirindo's writing. First, that he disengages all things very clearly and then puts it in such a way that your mind cannot reject this conclusion that you are accepting. You have to accept the conclusion which he wants you to accept because it is so logical and so practical, you see. It is long, but it is simply worth doing, he says. And if you say that your desire for the divine has become your master desire, I mean the first priority, 
then it follows that you won't mind any time that it takes because for, it is all worth that trial, is it not? So it is surely one can give one's whole life to it without repining and not grudge the time, the difficulty and the labor. For they are part of the of the liking for the decision that you have taken, I mean. Of course, somebody said that uh, uh, you, uh, you must undergo a change. And immediately the disciple thought that it was a, some sort of moral change that was required. Because generally moral values are considered to be high in society and in personal life. But in spiritual life, moral values are relative. They are a passage through which you pass. They are good to establish, you know, control over the, 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 the tendencies of the vital. To establish self-control, it is good to submit to some moral or ethical discipline. But ethical discipline is not an end in itself. It is not an attainment. It's only a passage. This is an important thing to bear in mind because in spiritual life there is a confusion otherwise where people think that ethical or moral values are final and you see somebody is very good. He is all the time devoting to public work and philanthropy or something like that. It doesn't mean that spiritually he is better at all. Or somebody is very bad. And therefore to say, therefore he is not fit for spiritual life. This is also not true. So these are, the, you see, values which have a temporary passing value for the person and for man. It is a passage which one has to go through. And it's a good step to acquire. It is good to be able to confirm to ethics from conscience, not from social pressure. Social ethics is only for preservation of society. People don't steal and stealing is considered bad because if stealing was considered ordinary, then there will be no safety of property. So it is quite good for society to make a rule that stealing is very bad. But the tendency not to steal must be a result from inner movement, not of outer pressure of society or fear of you know, punishment. That is how social order is preserved and it's good. Social existence cannot go on if certain values are not allowed to, to reign in society. One can't murder a, somebody whom he doesn't like. Now, you see, yes, because I don't like so and so, therefore, well, then we, that way there is no society will exist. So society has made, it, made the, the values there, they are only for preservation of law and order and social existence. They are not moral. A man observing non-stealing is not moral. It is only when he has full chance to steal and he doesn't steal, then you can say he is moral. Now, if a man has a chance, he does steal. Is it not if he can avoid the law? I mean, evade the police. He, is all, he does it all right. He doesn't mind stealing it. So that he has not been moral. He is compelled by social pressure to conform to standards that are current, but he is not. If it is a result of conscience, that is true morality. That is what the sadhak must acquire. And know that this confirmation of morality from the conscience is only the beginning. And a step towards a higher confirmation to a divine will, which may be or may not be in confirmation to the current standards of ethics. You see, in Hindu society, for instance, untouchability uh, was regarded as an article of social life and even of religious, you know, belief. Now, could you conform to that? You, you understand how moral it is? Then somebody has to, like Dan and Saraswati or Gandhi has to come and say, well, I will break this law. That is not really breaking ethics, you understand? Oh, that's it. That is bringing some higher element into, into, into human life, really speaking. So that what is current as values of ethical life is not final. It, it is something that you have to pass through. And if you pass through with your conscience alive or conscience active, well, you know that you use it as a passage and the, the spiritual life is beyond ethics. Therefore, he is replying to somebody, I did not mean a moral but a spiritual change. A moral man may be chokeful of ego. <laughs> a moral man may be chokeful of ego. And ego increased by his own goodness. 
and ego increased by his own rectitude. He all the time is thinking, I'm good, <laughs> and it's terrible. <laughs> he says, in effect, if I can tell you, I have met, I have worked in public for 16 years, and I can tell you, I've seen many good workers, I mean, very fine workers, but their feeling is all the time, if they were allowed to go into divine presence, what they would tell God, you know, I'll tell you, oh God, I'm very good. You know that I am very good. Mm -hmm. You know, I have kept account. I will show you that I am very good. All the time I have been, I have never been dishonest. I have been always serving public. I have been always, all the time he is looking on his eye and telling him to keep account and keep in mind and don't forget, I am good. <laughs> this is all it would come to, I tell you. I am good. And please, uh, therefore, reward me according to what I am. You know, I am good man, therefore give me nice things and so on. <laughs> this is first what he has to give up is this eye, you see. And the whole trouble is that he doesn't see it. <laughs> Simply because he thinks his goodness is increasing his ego also at the same time. Now it is good, instead of doing something bad, if he's doing that good, well that ego is not harmful. It is only he has to learn at one stage that this stage he must pass through. And if he doesn't give up, this keeping account with God is the worst thing, because what God does is a better accountant than he. <laughs> he says, oh, oh, yes, yes, you did. All right, you want with compound interest, take it. You take, oh, oh, yes, you invest so much, good, yes. All right, you take the compound interest, that's all. But a man says, look here, I am nothing. I am very bad even. I am wicked. I want to cease to be wicked. And I want to give my burden of improvement and change to you. I have nothing to add to you. Well, if you give yourself completely up like that, it is easy for the Divine to, to give Himself wholly, because then, because uh, there is no account now, you see. There is no account now. If you take your ten dollars or hundred dollars to an unlimited company and say, look here, this is nothing, I throw it away. This is your God, multi-million dollars, so you take my, I, nothing belongs to me. Immediately you become partner in the big firm. Then the whole of it may belong to you and the force of it may help you out in any difficult situation. But if you stick to it and say, look, this is so much invested, then you get back your compound interest only, you can't give back more. <laughs> you get a little addition, but <laughs> this is the difference between, you know, sattvic or moral ethical goodness and spiritual surrender. Two things which have to be distinguished and borne in mind because it is important. And he is replying here to somebody who said that a moral may be choke full of ego, an ego which is increased by his own goodness and rectitude. He says, I'm always honest. Freedom from ego is spiritually valuable because then one can be centered no longer in one's own personal self but in the divine. Afterwards, it becomes easy to establish the, the central existence of divine in oneself. If one is all the time centering himself in the eye, it's really hard. The one requirement is aspiration. That is one material one must take with him, aspiration. Intensity of aspiration brings intensity of experience. And by repeated intensity of experience, the change in nature will come. You see, when experience is repeated, the change comes. Aspiration, what is aspiration? It's a call to the divine. Then what is the will? Will is the pressure of a consciousness on nature. Aspiration is a call. Will is a pressure on nature. Either to change, to increase, to decrease, to reject, to whatever, whatever. It is a pressure exerted on nature. There is no need of words in aspiration. People ask that when we sit down in meditation and when we aspire, what is the formula? So there is no need of words in aspiration. It can be expressed or not expressed in words. You can express it in thought and word if you like, or you can only have a movement of consciousness. Aspiration need not be in the form of thought. It can be a feeling which remains even when the mind is attending to other work. When the mind is attending to other work, aspiration can remain because it's a feeling. 
that this is surrender to God or that they, I, I am offering this to the divine? Or uh, is there any part of egoism that uh, I am, you know, I mean, uh, allowing to act now? When can we watch food? Well, aspiration to thousand forms. And aspiration, in aspiration there is a self-giving for, for the higher consciousness to descend. One form of aspiration is to give yourself up to the higher consciousness and aspire or wish that and call that it may descend into you and take possession. The more intense the call, the greater is the self-giving. Intense the call, the more powerfully you will give yourself up to the higher power. Even if you are oppressed with opposition and difficulties, even if you stumble, even if the way seems closed to you, keep hold on your aspiration. Don't give up aspiration. If faith is clouded for a time, turn always in mind and heart to us and it will be removed. You turn to the divine or turn to your guru and they, immediately that will be removed. This maintenance or, or holding on to aspiration is in the language of the Veda. As I told you, the, the keeping up of the flame of fire. Aspiration is fire. In the Veda, they will say that fire is in the altar of the heart and the fire is burning. And uh, the man who is called Arya, you know, that the Aryan stock they are talking all over the world. The definition of Arya is one in whose house the fire is burning. Not in the house, because in every house the people are cooking and the fire is burning there. No, that is not the definition of Arya. Even of one who is not Arya, the fire is burning in the kitchen. The house is this house, the, the human being. One in whose, you know, self, the fire of aspiration is burning is the Arya. The Arya is one who is civilized or cultured or a, a man worth respecting. And uh, that man is worth respecting in whose heart or in the altar of whose heart the flame of aspiration is burning. So that uh, fire is, this, is the symbol of aspiration. When you say aspiration, it always brings to the mind of one who is accustomed to Indian way, fire, you know, flame of fire. And you have to constantly maintain the fire in the heart by putting into it some material which will burn. You see, desire or selfishness or egoism or whatever, that is the material which burns in this flame. You see, this flame is not material flame. People used to have also, and even now they have material fire. But that is a symbol of the inner fire where one lights the flame of aspiration and sacrifices, offers into that flame all the dross of human nature, all the lower elements of human nature which he comes to perceive. And this is the law of spiritual life and yogic life and practice of yoga, that once the aspiration is genuine and really awake, the knowledge of what is in the way of aspiration is always given to the man. It is a self-adjusting process, you see. You aspire and you sincerely aspire. Knowledge of what comes in the way of aspiration is given. Almost invariably you will find that it is there. You see, it is like aspiration is like a flame that uh, you know makes a hole in the ceiling, and from beyond uh, the, the ray of the sun is able to penetrate immediately, and when it penetrates, it shows the place and how it requires to be clean and purified. Well, that is first brought to notice when the aspiration is put forth sincerely and intensely and seriously. Well, the result is self-knowledge. And first beginning of self-knowledge is perception of one's own defects, imperfections, ignorance, or obstacles in one's own nature. That is what the fire reveals immediately. It is because the fire burns, you see, and touches the sun, as they say in Veda, you see, it touches the sun and the ray of the sun immediately comes and shows the area where the aspiration is obstructed. Well, then it is the task of this, uh, you, the man who practices yoga to reject. If he does not reject, then the progress stops. Stops means he is at that time, you know, status quo. It, it stands still. Till he 
willingly and seriously and sincerely rejects the imperfection that is shown to him. And this is shown invariably. This is a law of inner life, you see. That uh, because man is like a man, uh, somebody who is confined into a dark room and is trying to make his way out. Now, when he makes his way out from inside, immediately the uh, dark wall is not reduced to zero. But uh, if you go on persistently, naturally the darkness is thin. And then, of course, a chink is made. And when the chink is made, the light comes through immediately. And then the, the knowledge of the dark room and whatever is lying inside is brought to the man. The first obstacle, second obstacle, third obstacle, one by one. And he must reject. It is the responsibility of the yogi to reject what is shown to him as obstruction to the fulfillment of his aspiration, you see. If faith is clouded, then the, 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 uh, uh, well, turn always to the Guru and it will be removed. If you can't remove yourself, you take the help of the Divine or your guide and it will be removed. But you must want to remove it seriously. It is when people have a double mind, you see. One part rejecting and another part holding on and saying, no, no, I can't give up. <laughs> this is a, the play of human ignorance I have seen in now. Many, many cases you see, in, in majority of cases, when they say, I want to give up, they don't realize that one part doesn't want to give up. If they see very impersonally, they will see that there is double part. One part is for giving up and one part is for holding it back. And it is this holding back that is the obstacle. If that can let go, you will see the change is immediate. And that persuasion has to be done by oneself with the help of the Guru or help of the Divine. Some disciple wrote to him that, you see, I want to have faith, but in order to have faith, I must have experience of spiritual life. So it, it is quite wrong. It is like, uh, you know, just putting the cart before the horse. It is not correct at all. <laughs> faith does not depend upon experience at all. <laughs> it is something that is there before experience. Otherwise, it's not faith. When one starts the yoga, it is not usually on the strength of experience, but on the strength of faith. It is so not only in yoga, but in, in spiritual life, but in ordinary life. When a man goes to the laboratory and says, I want to find out the constitution of electricity, well, he doesn't know. He has no experience. He has faith that he will find it. <laughs> Isn't it? When he begins first to fly in the air, well, he, there is no certainty. It's only an act of faith that I'll be able to do it. You see, you start in all human undertaking, it is faith with which you start, any great thing. So, you know, all men of action, discoverers, inventors and creators of knowledge proceeded by faith. They didn't proceed on, on experience. Faith is a soul's witness to something not yet manifested. It is some inner witness which bears witness to that which is not yet seen here. Not yet manifested, achieved or realized, but which yet the knower within us, even in the absence of all indication, feels to be true and supremely worth following and achieving. That is faith. That's why Ramakrishna always used to say, somebody said that, oh, this man has got blind faith. So Ramakrishna said, faith is always blind, otherwise it's not faith. <laughs> there is no faith. Faith must be blind because otherwise it's not faith. Then it's knowledge. Experience is not necessary for faith. Thousands of people have faith before they have experience. The saint and the devotee has faith in God long before they have experience of God. For me, faith is not intellectual belief, but a function of the soul. So that, that is some witness from the soul that is working in you when faith is, is asserting itself. If one feels a call, one follows it. If there is no call, then there is no need to seek the divine. No need for yoga. Faith is sufficient to start with. Even a faltering faith and a slow faith and a partial surrender have their own force and the result. Otherwise, only the rare few can try to practice yoga. 
but you all have to practice or a large number of persons have to practice then you start with whatever faith one has whatever uh, partial surrender one can gather faith is a glimpse of a truth which the mind has not seized as knowledge as yet in the early part of sadhana i don't mean by early a short period Effort is indispensable. You cannot say that God will do everything. Surrender, of course, but surrender is not a thing that is done in a day. One does not make the surrender in one day. The mind has its ideas and mind clings, clings to them. The human vital resists surrender. For what it calls surrender in early stages is a doubtful kind of self-giving with a demand in it. The physical consciousness of man is like a stone and what it calls surrender often is no more than inertia. It is only the psychic being the inmost soul that knows how to surrender and the psychic is usually very much veiled in the beginning. Spiritual effort. I think I stopped there for tonight. Then you are free with all the three. Ideal. And we are coming to the foundation, very near the foundations now. Would you explain that some people here haven't been uh, in the classes all the time, the meaning of psychic being, it's the, it's the equivalent of the divine spark, isn't it the same as the spark of the divine in the humans? Yes, that is to say there is mind, intellect or mind, intellectual being in man, which is not active in many person, but still it is present as a as a partial power which can be activated anytime. Mind is one, emotional being is second, where he feels the feelings and you know the emotions of life. And third is the vital being where which is a seat of desire, ambition, and uh, impulses and action and victory and so on, conquest, expansion, and so on. These are the three main divisions. There are many other mind also, intellectual being or mental being, emotional being, and vital being. The part of action, part of feeling and part of thinking. Behind this is the true spark of the individual, the true being of man. These are nature personalities which are necessary for growth, which tend to grow also. Mental personality can develop and seek knowledge. The vital personality can seek to act and carry out in life the truth. Or the emotional personality can seek satisfaction in reaching the divine and surrendering with all the emotional wealth to the divine and so on. But these activities are on the surface of nature and are egoistic in their movements. That which is really working behind is the true man, the true being of man, the psychic being or the soul. The soul is the person, true personality. All these are representative nature personalities of the true individual. The true individual is a psychic being. And this, it is a psychic being that goes man to seek truth, seek perfection, seek a higher ideal. Whenever a man is after something, he may do it with his mind. But it is a psychic working in his mind that makes him seek. You understand? All higher activities of man, when man is projecting himself into uh, an effort at perfection, realizing an ideal, or some great deed or some, you know, purpose of life and so on, it is a psyche being that that is guiding him from behind. And that leads him ultimately to, to a higher consciousness till he, well, succeeds in reaching the divine. Because the psychic is portion of the divine sent down here in ignorance to prepare this ignorant nature to receive the divine here. And Subsequently, to change the human nature, first by the psychic pressure, so the first step of transformation will be psychicization, second step will be universalization of nature, and third will be supramentalization. That by three stages the transformation of nature will be attained. But the first step is by the governance of whole nature by the psychic being, the inner soul, the inmost divine entity in man, the true individual, who is not egoistic who is only a portion of the divine representative of the divine meant here to carry out the divine will or divine purpose in the individual. Inner soul by some people, it is called inner soul, the true soul, 
than the, this the divine person in man. So the psychic and the psychic the same. Yes. And is it true that that um, it's from the soul center that the current flow to all realms of being, and they have to flow through the soul, don't they? And then to the heart, and then to the mental life. <laughs> Normally the soul is not awake in man. The function of yoga is to make man conscious of the soul. It is in yoga that one can become conscious of the soul. Normally it is very much withdrawn behind and works from behind the veil. It's like a man throwing an angle, you know, in this in the water and catching the fish. The psychic being has to throw its angle into nature into mind, into emotional being, into vital being, and uh, entangle the human individual to, to pull him inside, to make him conscious of the... Yes, that's what it happens, actually. <laughs> you see? <laughs> it is all the time throwing, but the human being is very clever. He avoids all the time. <laughs> he is not easily caught. <laughs> it's a fish that doesn't take the bait. <laughs> <laughs> It takes something else all the time because that is a taste which he thinks is not nice. <laughs> but he's throwing out a bait all the time. And it's there that when once one part catches, well, then it tries to steady. And after steadying, that nature part is made to turn inside, you see. It may be intellect. Then, wow, well, that requires sincere seeking. If the intellect is true to the call, then it will persist to the end and arrive at something. That is how the first turning takes place, you see. Turning is by persuading a part of nature to accept the necessity of change, progress, perfection, ideal or something like that. That is why in normal life it works with the human ignorant being trying to give him some conception of truth, some idea of right, some idea of good, you see, some idea of uh, nobility, some idea of something for which he can sacrifice, something for a noble cause, you see, some conception of beauty, some, these, these are the ways in which it persuades the, 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 pulls the being towards the real change of inner life, you see. There is a psychic interference in nature part, but it is such that man doesn't easily react to it, you know, doesn't accept it. Give just a brief definition of the meaning of yoga, Gurani, or um, in case we, perhaps somebody here might not uh, might not understand the meaning of yoga. I think you give yoga is an effort at self culture. You can say at changing consciousness, not in acquiring mental knowledge or information, but a process of gradually bringing about a change of consciousness. Changing the very foundations, as I was telling now. You see, the foundation of nature now is egoism and desire and ambition and selfishness and, you know, all, all kinds of play of conflict and ignorance and so on. That is divided consciousness. Now, that foundation is to be changed. Yoga is to effect real change in the foundation. That is Sri Aurobindo's yoga. There are other yogas, as I told you, which keep the foundation as it is and add an experience, identity with God, merging into some condition of consciousness, peace at times, and then coming back and again nature going on as usual. Well, that is, there is a very partial effort at yoga, which helps a man, which is good in itself, there is nothing wrong in it. If one is attracted by that, one can do that. So, that problem of man cannot be changed till man is changed, because man is the problem. This is our stand. We saw yesterday we have discussed it. You remember that? That problem is not economical, international, political, social, and uh, you know, all, all. That is not, that is there. It's secondary. The change is man. That is the problem. If you can change man, then the problem can be solved. Because now what man is doing, that he remains what he is, and he thinks that by legislation, by uh, constitution by institution by some outer change the change will come it cannot come by any outer change it, he will remain what he is all the time and when he gets an opportunity he will be just what he is so 
it is only fear of conditions, circumstances, or failure, or difficulty, or danger that will keep him back. But that is not a change. That really solves not the problem. If we can destroy the world without destroying ourselves, well, I can let go the atom bomb in no time. You see? That's all. If I am sure that I won't be affected by it. <laughs> yes, that is to say, it is, it is only the fear that is, that is, it's not genuine change. And the, well, the problem is how to change na nature. And it cannot be changed unless one is prepared to change. You cannot compel a man to change. He must want to change. That is why I told you the definition of God as the greatest democrat who never interferes in your affair till you choose him and vote for him. <laughs> 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 he leaves you severely alone to your perfect ignorant independence. <laughs> he leaves you full liberty to remain ignorant if you want to. No harm. If you say, no, I don't want to remain ignorant, I want you, well then of course, then he be begins to interfere, not otherwise. So. It is a voluntary effort to be undertaken, but that is the effort in the right direction, to change nature and bring the light of the divine, harmony of the divine, consciousness of the divine in life. And because divine is in all, even if it plays in a few centers, you will see a play of harmony only. Because one truth working in, in different forms cannot conflict. It is only different individuals and separated personalities that were acting creates conflicts, you see. But if, because divine is one, there are no two divines. And divine in different centers manifests himself differently. If he manifests himself in 100 centers differently, there will be no conflict. It will be a harmonious play because the, the source of inspiration is one. It will be always a harmonious play of life. And that is what life wants. The world life wants to get rid of his conflict. The harmonious play will come only when the original truth is allowed to play in life. The original truth is a divine. So that is, that is the only way to solve human problems, you see. To allow the one truth to work. One truth in thousand, multi-million multi -million forms to work. Well, in all the multi-million forms there will be a harmony. There will be no conflict. And then life will attain a, a perfection which is not imaginable now. You see, it is, it is a, it's a conception which is itself, you know, what you call, it is the sublime that strikes you with awe. What is the name of the yoga that will bring this about? You can name it anything. You can call it Serundo's Yoga, Integral Yoga, Purna Yoga. And the name is not important. That's the process. Well, you said some yoga is marked. Uh... Yes, there, there are so many hundreds. In India, there are hundred methods. You see, there are people who awaken, as I told you, the vital being because they have a vital power uh, to put their impulse into somebody and awaken vital force in them. And then they think this is yoga. It's good in its own way, quite nice. There are people who go only by mantra. There are people who devote only to the sun. There are others who devoted to one particular deity, Hanuman or Ram or you see like that. Then in Tantra there are devis, goddesses to whom one, you know, devotes his sadhana and, and realizes some power of the of the aspect of the divine motherhood, you see. In Bengal particularly there are many like that. So it depends on the aim of yoga, you see. And in this, as we were seeing in our, you know, talk, what we want to do is to, to see that, first of all, the aim is as wide as possible and then the fulfillment is as synthetic as possible so as not to leave out any power of nature from the scheme of fulfillment. So that the, we seek a fulfillment of the divine will in ourselves, in the intellect, in the emotional being, in the vital being, in the nervous being and in the physical being. All the nature, you know, organism of man is admitted as fit for, well, taking part in divine perfection. How to do? Well, that is what we are trying to find out. How to proceed? First, the materials to be gathered, a foundation is to be laid down, and then one has to evoke the higher power, and the higher power is dynamic. Therefore, much burden of the sadhana, almost after the beginning, is taken up by the higher power. 
the higher power does the work because it is that which wants and, and intends to manifest itself here. The cre intention of the creation is not to make yogis who will feel that they are great. You, you understand that they have realized the truth and so on, but to bring a truth which is already there here. It is there. It is to be brought. And if yogis are there, they have to be channels for the working of that higher power and transform their nature and see that life also is transformed so that the divine manifests here in life or on earth. That is the problem. Problem is how to bring the light of the Supreme in earth consciousness. And to this, Yarno devoted 40 years of his life only to solve this problem as to how to bring a higher than mental consciousness in contact with earth consciousness. This is what he did. And he solved this problem. He's, he solved this problem, yes. That is why he made out this path that, look, now the possibility is that the higher power is there and the earth consciousness is in contact. Well, as many people from earth as want to contact, well, the contact is ready. It is there for human being now to have a sincere aspiration uh, for the higher power to work on them. Whereas 100 years back, it would have been more difficult, certainly. That I myself would not have thought it possible if I didn't know Shervindu. I would never even dreamed that this was possible. Because it is something tremendous. You can't imagine what it means. It means changing human being into a divine being. No joke. Which he is, is essential and fundamental in his consciousness. He is divine. Now nobody ever thought that this could be achieved on earth consciousness. Like that scientifically with a rationale, with a logic and with a path. A logic is there and a path is there. There is a philosophy and a yogic method. And she says here, this is the way you try. This is the conviction you can have. So I don't think that this happened before in the, in the growth of mankind. Because it is now possible and necessary. It has come now because now it is possible because mankind has so much awakened in intellectual consciousness that now the, the information can go to everybody. That is one. And then many hearts are turned to this truth also on a much larger scale than ever before. On all continents people are wanting because whole psychological revolution has taken place on account of the disturbance in life which has been brought about by two shocks of the world war. You see, so there is great seeking. So the possibilities are great. Therefore, it is there ready for man if you want to take. It is for, for, for the present, you know, mankind's condition that that is suggested as a remedy. The present problem and set of problems. And the present mind and its, uh, its constitution. One, and present man's capacity and his uh, power to attain. Well, it is equal to this. That's why it is pointed out in that way. So there is no local color attached to it. There is no book in which you have to believe or there is no authority you have to accept. You only to see whether you have the call, whether you have the aspiration within you, whether you want seriously to take up the trial. That's one. And whether you may admit the logicity of the path and possibilities that here. It seems prima facie a path that can be tried. Well, then it's open to anyone to try. How long have you been with this? Hi, pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty long, <laughs> about 40 years. About 40 years. <laughs> I'm trying to you know, in, in order to try and upon the cherry, hmm. uh, where they have all these young students. Yes, we have four, 450 about, yes. And now, uh, how, do, how do you see this working out in them? We are not working out directly on them. No, you're not. They are only taking advantage of the atmosphere. Ashram is an atmosphere. There is no doubt about that. Anybody who coming feels it. Even one who doesn't know what is yoga feels it. Yep. So there is an atmosphere. And the students are allowed to take advantage of this atmosphere and grow up. If they want to take up yoga, they can. If they don't want, they cannot. Need not. There is no comfort. They are not taught yoga. They are. Uh, and that, that's what I, I wonder. Is it, is it this culture, yes, this culture. They, they can attend meditation if they want to, but if they don't want, there is no compulsion, it's voluntary. What do you well, yeah. well, in the morning when mother is there, most of them come, but sometimes they don't come. In the playground, there is meditation, most of two thirds or three fourths attend, one fourth or one third don't attend. 
It's a short meditation of 15 minutes, perhaps. It's only meditation, nothing else. There isn't anything compulsory at the actual meditation. No, nothing. Yoga, at least, is not compulsory. <laughs> Cleanliness is compulsory sometimes, but not yoga. <laughs> <laughs> you must keep the place clean. That is compulsory. <laughs> I was really um, saying from India what we have in the Christian prayer that will be done on earth. Yes, as it is in heaven. Yes, that is the fulfillment intended. Uh, they have forgotten cleanly. I mean, I, I have not seen anybody who remembers it. And makes an effort at it. <laughs> yes, there are agencies that are trying. <laughs> I guess I'm not. And because the teaching, uh, he teaches, uh, he teaches that we're all sinners and that our carnal nature mm -hmm. must be changed and is changed by faith, yes. not by reason and accepting mm -hmm. God. But uh, it might have to continue. Yes. Yeah, the transformation idea is not worked out. There is a hint about when you say that on earth as it is in heaven, now how it will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and how it is in heaven. You see, I give you how the change is to be seen. The idea is there and the ideal is there, that this is to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then somebody can legitimately ask, well, how is it in heaven? One. And how is it to be done and by what process? Then you go to see Arvind, though. That's all. <laughs> how it is in heaven, then he points out, this is how it is there. And how it is to be done, he points out the process that is to be done here. So it is all right. It is a fulfillment of what is wanted now. It's quite right. It's in a line, you see. It is nothing. Yes, it is not one um, cutting, cutting like that. It is like one road like that. So what is done here is supporting what is to be done here. You see, it is, it is in a line. It doesn't go against the grain at all. It fulfills on the contrary, I think. It fulfills on the contrary, I think. Yeah. And because the divine is one, the divine at one point gave the ideal, a divine at another point is pointing out the details of the ideal. What is wrong there? I don't understand. The divine at one point gives a full ideal. At another point, he points out how the ideal is to be applied and how the method is to be carried out. Quite. Quite is consistent. I don't see any difficulty at all. <laughs> it's a rational age. So these questions were didn't I didn't rise at that time, you see. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Here, uh, up here at the beginning of each astrological age. But that takes into takes for granted astrological age, isn't it? Oh. What are the astrological age, one will ask? I don't know, but I think about it. Like, <laughs> but uh, aren't there supposed to be periods every 2,000 years that are somehow... That is one man only, I think Oswald Spangler, who wants to make that theory, is it oh. not? It's Oswald Spangler. Now it is discredited theory of history of human growth. And uh, he wrote two very fine volumes, a German, before the First World War, I think. Just mm -hmm. two or three years before the First World War. Uh, uh, decline of the West, that is the title of the book, and it's a very well-written book, but very one-sided in his idea. And he wants to put out this theory that human evolution takes a turn every 2,000 years. Every culture rises uh, to a acme and arrives at the, at the top. After 2,000 years, it will go down. You see, this is the law. And so he said that the European culture has reached the acme, it must now go down. And his another idea is that uh, all other cultures have worked out and this culture also will go. And so what is to follow, he can't predict. There are many ideas like that in his writing, but I think that this is a very debatable point. Firstly, because a culture that has become weak has also a power to resuscitate itself. He didn't seem to take note of that. He only thought that a culture that has gone down is finished. That is not true. This is the English, English were ruled by the Romans. Let us take one instance. Or, at one time, the, the Poles were ruled by the Russians. 
or in fact Poland was twice or thrice divided in history, you know, between two or three powers, Germany, Russia and Austria perhaps, you see, three times. And yet Poland persists. And now Poland is an entity today. Ireland was occupied in England for so many years. And Ireland is an entity even now. You see, so because a culture or a country or a race goes down, it is not that it has no power to resuscitate itself or rejuvenate its life. It can. So 2000 years is not the final limit of, you know, culture's self-exhaustion. It can renew itself and again have another cycle. And that cycle is not periodically fixed, I think. You can say that uh, in, in inner life of race or culture, there is some wave motion, up and down wave motion. And uh, to reduce it to a rigid formula would be rather artificial, I think. I don't think that race consciousness or collective life could be reduced to a very hard and fast rigid intellectual formula. That would be. So you see, the collective life is now growing towards the unity. We'll come to it when we read his ideal of human unity. We are not going to do life divine only. We are going to do his ideal of human unity also and human cycle. So. <laughs> You know, if you are to do life divine, you will go to sleep, all of you, I think, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> no, not to sleep, I think. It is very interesting, but uh, there is other problem which it takes, sociology and international politics and unity of mankind, on which he works out his idea of how it can be achieved by inner factors and not by outer organization, only which is secondary, which is important and has its place. And there he points out the factors which are to be brought into active movement if uh, man is to attain the unity of humanity. And now all the local cultures are in fact, you know, uh, trying to or will have ultimately to become part of one culture. That is the time already has come. I don't say tomorrow, but uh, within 100 years or 50 years. That is what is coming, a, a composite human culture. And that is why we are in a in a sort of a well uh, an anxious condition because the values of that human culture, which will be for the whole of humanity, must be such as to be deserving the dignity of man. If only man has got the present set of values, economic values only, and political and you know strategic value and money, that that is not not enough to create a real human culture. The true basis of human culture is the fundamental divinity of man. It is on that that you have to build up the unity of mankind. You cannot build upon any other basis. That is why after such a long time of you know, hard work and at old age, we take up the undertake the task of coming here. <laughs> that we must challenge this culture at present dominating mankind because it is putting partial value in the place of high value. And though it is indispensable to have economic self-sufficiency and prosperity, economy cannot be the higher value of collective life of man. If mankind is to become one, it must become one on the basis that all men are divine, essentially, fundamentally. Even if they are undivine in their action today, we must as proceed on the assumption that all are divine. And how to bring that in, innate fundamental potential divinity into life would be his real task of culture. That culture, if he can build upon the basis of how to activate, how to manifest that divinity in man, if he makes an effort and he creates a culture, that will be real culture of man. That will be his true culture. And that will be worthy of the whole of human race as one to, to make that effort. And in that, economic progress will play a great part, you see. It can play a very decisive part, but it is in its place. If you dominate, then man will be running after money all the time and making his life miserable, which he has done. <laughs>